All right, uh, I had a couple of requests on, on, on re re reviewing cer certain things, so I'm going to do a few. I just picked a few examples that I'll talk about, but if, if in the meantime you think of anything else you want to, to ask, then, then ask at any point. Okay? So, um, for, first, here, here's kind of a famous uh, example that, that, that I wanted to go through anyway, which is good review of, of geometric distribution and expectations. Uh, then we will talk more about the universality of the uniforms, since that, that, that's the number one re request. Um, okay, but, but for, first let's do a, a problem called the uh, coupon collector. I think a couple of the sections did, did, did this problem or, or something similar, but, but, um, but um, not all of them, definitely. Uh, this is this is a really good example. It, it, it happens to be very useful in a lot of cases. Um, I, I think of it as the toy collector problem because I don't collect coupons. Well, I don't really collect toys either, but I'd rather collect toys than coupons. The problem is that you 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 have a certain number of different types of toys, and you want to collect a full set. And it's like one of these li li like Happy Meal type of things where you know you buy a Happy Meal at McDonald's or whatever, and you, you get a random toy, and you want the, the, the full set, right? That's the problem. The problem is, on average, how long will it take you to collect the full set, OK? So we have a certain number of, of toys, let's, let, let's say n uh, toy types. I say type just because. To distinguish between the individual toys, you might you might get seven of, of, of the same toy, right? But but I mean seven of the same type, but but seven physical objects. So so they're they're t n types, and we'll assume that they're equally likely. Now in practice, they probably will make one one really hard to find, so that then people go berserk, you know, going on eBay and stuff trying to track down the one hard one. But but we'll assume right now they're equally likely. Problem gets very, very messy if they're not equally likely. Like really, really tedious, long calculations that go on for pages. So it's not something you certainly it's not something you, need, you would need to worry about for for an exam in, in this course because the the problems that you will have to deal with or you'll have to deal with should have very short, nice solutions. And it gets really nasty if the probabilities are are unequal. But in this case, it, it works out really nicely. So the question is, find the expected time to, to collect a full set, where, where time is just measured discreetly in terms of how many toys you need, you need to buy, right? Expected time, i.e. number of toys, uh, until you have a complete set. And if you think of breaking up this random variable into, into smaller random variables, then it, it, it's easy to think about how to do this. So if we call this t, t for time and t for toys, we want to know the ex t is the number of toys that, that we need to collect to get a full set. Let's think of just breaking down t uh, in, in, into components. So it's t1 plus t2 plus blah, 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 plus tn, where T1 equals time until first new toy. By new, I mean a toy that we didn't already have. Well, that's actually equal to 1, because the first one you get, that's your first toy, and you didn't already have it, obviously. OK? So that one, T1 is actually just a constant, always equal to 1. Now, T2, after you've collected your first toy, if you're unlucky, the second toy is the same as the first toy. But most of the time, you get something new on the second try. Okay, so so t2 is the additional time until until your second new toy. So new just means one you didn't already collect earlier in the process. So additional time until second new toy, and then t3 is same thing until the, the third, and so on. So additional time after the second. That is, you, you know, collect, 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 till you get your second toy, collect, 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 till you get the third, and keep going like that until you have all of them. So all the way up to Tn, OK? Then uh, notice that 
T1 is just equal to 1. But T2, let's think about T2. So, so we, we have one, there are n different toy types, and we have 1 out of the n. So there's an n minus 1 over n chance that the, that the next one is going to be something new, right? That, so we would consider that a success. So the success probably is n minus 1 over n. On the other hand, with probably 1 over n, we get a failure in the sense of collecting a toy we already had, and then it's the same problem again. So, so therefore, t1, uh, t2 minus 1 is geometric with probability of success n minus 1 over n. The minus 1 is just because of the convention about the geometric, that we're taking the convention that the geometric starts at 0. But of course, you need at least one more new toy, so I'm subtracting off that, that one. And, and, so, and, and in general, tj minus 1 is going to be geometric. So tj, we're, we're trying to get the jth toy, right? That means that we already have collected j minus 1 toys. So, so it's going to be n minus the number we've already collected, which is j minus 1. So they're all geometrics. Uh, then we can immediately write down the answer. In this case, these, are, these t's are independent, but linearity would hold even if these were dependent. Here they're independent because, because right, it's just like how long does it take you to get your second new toy, but that has nothing to do with telling you how long, the additional time, right? Uh, but even if they were not independent, it would still be true that e of t equals the sum, e of t1 plus e of t2 plus e of t n. And just to simplify that, uh, write out what that is. Uh, so that's e of t equals, so e of t1 is just 1. e of t2, well, um, we talked about the fact that if you have a geometric starting out at 1, then the mean is 1 over p, because that's q over p plus 1, uh, because we're adding back the 1. So the, so, the, so, the, so the next one is just going to be the reciprocal of this, which is n over n minus 1. And then the next one is going to be n over n minus 2, and so on. And then for the last term, uh, that means that we have n minus 1 out of the n types. Then our probability of success is only uh, 1 over n, right? So, so for, for the last one, the, it, it's n, which we, let's just write this as n over 1. Then we can factor out n. And so this is really just n times, and I'll, I'll, I'll swap, reverse the order of terms just to make it look nicer. It's n times 1 half, 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus blah, 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 plus 1 over n. So that's called the, the, the nth harmonic sum, right? That looks like the harmonic series. Uh, this is approximately. Uh, n log n for, for large n. That's just a useful fact about the harmonic series that we can approximate it as, as, as logarithmic. But, you know, and, and, and just in general, for, for midterm and homework and, and stuff, you should give exact answers unless you're asked for an approximation. So this would be the exact answer, but this would be a, a handy approximation for, for large n. So anyway, uh, so we just used linearity and geometrics here, and then you know, sounds like it could have been a hard problem, but as soon as you break it up in, into pieces like that, use linearity, then it becomes an easy problem. Okay, so let, let's talk a little more about the uh, universality stuff, which there's always questions about. So I just want to draw a little picture and, and do, do a quick example to, to, to show more about what's going on with that. So here, first, here's, here's a picture. So we're talking in, in the continuous case. So we have an x and f of x. So we're just, just imagine drawing a, a CDF. And remember, CDFs, you know, they have to be increasing and right continuous. But for universality, we're assuming that it's strictly increasing and it's, and it's continuous. So just draw some kind of CDF. Maybe it, maybe it looks like that, and you know, e either uh, either it hits one and then it would stay one forever, or it just asymptotically approaches one. Either way is fine. 
uh, but just, just to have like a picture in mind of, of what, what's universality really saying, what it says is, for example, uh, what if we chose a random, so th this, is, this is lowercase x here, this is just the x-axis, okay? But what if we chose a point on the x-axis randomly, okay? So, so the question is why, basically, um, let x be distributed according to f. So x is the random variable, f, f is, the, is this curve, this CDF, okay? And the claim is that when you plug x, this is, this is, this is you know, one half of the universality. Remember, we talked about two parts, which, which are equivalent, so just talk about one of them right now. We said that if we plug x into its own CDF, we'll get a uniform. So I just want to explain using this picture why, why is that true. Uh, I think the easiest way to think of it is, to, is just to make it a little bit more concrete and, and, and pick, pick a certain number here. Let, 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 let's say, let, let's pick a, a number on the vertical. So, so here's one, and may, maybe it hits one, and then it, then it would stay at one forever. Okay. Now let's pick some other number on the vertical axis. Let's, let's say here is one-third. So I, I just picked a, a y value of one-third. Okay. And, and suppose that I ask the question, and uh, so let's call, let's call this point here x sub 0. So x 0 is the point such that f of x 0 equals 1 third, right? That's the, you know, just in, inverse of a function. Okay, so, so in other words, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just making up, for some reason it looks really abstract at first, but I found that if I just make up a number like 1 third, it's easier to see what's going on. So, one th you know, you could have chosen any number between 0 and 1, but I picked 1 third. Okay, so I, so I assumed that f of x 0 equals 1 third, now, I want to know what's the probability that f of capital X, that's a random variable, right? Because we're plugging this random variable into its own CDF. Okay, we want to know what's the probability that this is less than or equal to one third, where, so, so the interpretation of this f of capital X is we first pick a random value on the x axis according to this distribution, right? This distribution is telling us. How do we select the random x value? And then we compute the corresponding y value, which is f, f of x, right? So, so that, that's how you compute f of x. But, but notice that, that that's true uh, exactly. So I'm picking a random point here, you know, somewhere on this x-axis, and I'm saying, when, when is it true that the y value is less than or equal to 1 third? Well, that's the same thing as saying that the x value has to be between here and here, right? Because if x were to the right, and I go up here, it's bigger than a third. And I said less than or equal to one third, okay? So that's the exact same thing as saying x is less than or equal to this x zero, but by definition of the CDF, that's f of x zero equals one third. And there was nothing special about one third here. You could do this for, for whatever number you want between zero and one. That's the uniform distribution. Right? The uniform distribution is saying that probability is proportional to length. And for the uniform 0, 1, probability is length with, within that interval 0 to 1. So that, that's what we just verified, that we, 1 third uh, became 1, 1 third. Okay? So, 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 so all this is saying is that um, the claim is that f of x is uniform between 0 and 1. And if you do the same calculation with any number here instead of one third, any number between zero and one, same same thing holds. So that, that's what it's that's what it's saying geometrically. Okay, we're just relating, you know, random point on the x-axis to picking to getting a random value vertically between zero and one. Okay, and a, as a quick example of how you might use that, uh, suppose you you wanted to. Uh, simulate from the logistic distribution. We haven't defined the logistic distribution yet, but I'll just tell you what it is right now. The logistic distribution, uh, which is another important distribution in, in statistics, that it's, it's, it's used in, in what's called logistic regression, for, for example, which is a very, very, very widely used uh, method in, in economics and statistics and elsewhere. It's based on the logistic distribution, which has the following CDF. F of x equals e to the x over 1 plus e to the x. This is for all real x. For practice with CDFs, you, you can verify that this 
this is a valid CDF. Right? There's three properties. It's continuous, increasing, and so on. So you, you should check for yourself that this, this function I wrote down does have the properties of a CDF. So that's a valid CDF, but that doesn't tell us how we could ever simulate random variables that have that CDF. And if we wanted to do that, an easy way to do it would be let u be uniform 0, 1, which is easy to simulate, and then uh, l consider just doing f inverse of u. So if you set this thing equal to u, and then this, this is uh, u in terms of x, but solve for x in terms of u just, just, just by doing the in inverse, just a little bit of algebra to get the inverse, what you'll get is this function log of u, u over 1 minus u. So that's, that's just the inverse evaluated at u. To just do the algebra, compute the inverse of this, and that's what you'll get. That's another, so, so, so uh, that, that would be interpreted as the log of the odds, basically, if you think of this. If, if u were just a, a, a probability between 0 and 1, that would be the log of the odds. Uh, but in this case, u is a random variable. So we plugged it into its inverse CDF, and then that would be logistic. So if you just computed this thing, then you would have a random draw from the logistic distribution. Now, if you wanted, you know, you can check that that's true just by taking this thing and computing, just compute directly its CDF, use the definition of CDF, and you'll get this. But it's easier to, to recognize, you know, that, that that's really why it's working. Okay, so um, are there more questions that you've thought of since before? I have a few more examples that, that, that I thought of and things to talk about. But anyway, uh, let me know if you think of any other questions. Uh, I want to do something with, with more with symmetry and linearity. So here's just a fun little symmetry problem I made up. So let x, y, z, this is just good practice with linearity and symmetry and what, what does IID actually mean, things like that. So let's let x, y, and z be IID positive random variables. And the problem is find the expected value of x over x plus y plus z. Okay. Now, you, you can't do linearity on a quotient. You can't just say that this is e of the top over e of the bottom or anything like that. That's not linearity. You can't do thing, things like that. Linearity is for sums. Okay, so at first this looks like kind of a mysterious problem maybe in that we haven't really dealt much with quotients of random variables and I didn't give you any explicit formula for the CDF or the PDF. I didn't say if they're discrete or continuous. I, ju I just said they're IID positive random variables. I only said they're positive just that we don't have to worry about dividing by zero, okay? I, no, no other assumptions, so this is very general, okay? Uh, so, so, so to solve this, we just need to see the symmetry of the problem. The symmetry is that we have three IID random variables, okay? And we took one of them divided by the sum of all three of them. But by, by symmetry, that has to be the same as e of y over x plus y plus z, right? Because I could have listed these in a different order and it would have been the same problem, right? It, it, it's completely symmetrical because they're IID. So, I mean, maybe I should have written y plus x plus z, but that's the same thing, right? It doesn't matter what order you add them in. So that's the exact same thing, but by symmetry, Similarly, that's the exact same thing as e of z over x plus y plus z. So what, whatever this quantity is, it, it, it doesn't matter which, which, which way we write it because, because they're, they're, they're iid. I'm not saying x equals y. I'm just saying this problem, if I'd asked you this problem, that has the same structure as this problem, has the same structure as this problem, they must be the same thing by symmetry. So, so the, these two steps are by symmetry. Okay, well now, I have these three different expectations, and that makes me think of adding them and using linearity. 
So what if, what if we added these three things? Uh, we, so if we added them, that would be e of x over x plus y plus z plus y over y, e of y over x plus y plus z plus e of z over x plus y plus z. Oops. X over, this is, sorry, this is z over x plus y plus z. And then use linearity. By linearity, that's just e of x plus y plus z over x plus y plus z. OK, now that's a very easy problem. Expected value of 1 is 1. But on the other hand, this is the same thing added three times. So three times this thing is 1. So that tells us that, that the thing we want is 1 third. So it's, a, it's basically immediate by symmetry and linearity. Uh, and I think intuitively, this, this seems like a very kind of general thing, and like how, how did that always work? But if you think about this, that, that's a pretty intuitive answer. Like that would, that would have been a good guess. If you had done this and gotten like four as your answer, you should immediately know that that, that would be wrong because the denominator, it's a number between zero and one, right? The denominator is bigger than the numerator. I said they're positive. So it has to be something between 0 and 1. One third makes sense, because if I asked you just intuitively, we have three things. And how much would you guess that one thing contributes to the total? One out of three things, you would guess 1 third. So it's just a pretty intuitive answer. Uh, but, but that's not a proof, and, and this is a proof. OK? So that's just an example of sym symmetry, linearity, that, that stuff. Um, another thing we should talk a little more about is, is lotus, because lotus is something that you know, looks very, very simple, but, but uh, students make, make mistakes a lot with, with it. So um, here's, a lo here's a simple lotus example that I made up. So here's the problem. Uh, the problem is, let u be uniform 0, 1, and let x equal u squared, and let y equal uh, e to the x. Is that what I want? Yeah, e to the x. And, we wanna, and the problem is to find the expected value of y as an integral. I mean, in general, like on the on the midterm, I'll, I'll be very clear about like if, if you know you might have a hard integral that you wouldn't have to do. I would say leave it as an integral in that case. Or if if it's you know stated that you should actually compute the thing, you know, so I'll basically I'll say whether it should be left as a sum or an integral. Or if it doesn't say leave it as an integral, then you should get an actual you know number and fully simplify everything. Okay, so in this case, so suppose I said find this as an integral. Uh, well, it's clearly a lotus problem, and there, 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 there's two approaches you, you could take. And, and, but a lot of students in, in previous years have kind of mixed up the d different approaches. And, and, and it's kind of for an in interesting uh, reason that I wanted to tell you about. So uh, one approach would be to say e of y. Uh, so we want expected value of y. Well, that just looks like an easy lotus problem, right? So e of y equals lotus says we. We integrate, we'll just change capital X to lowercase x. So we go uh, e to the x times the PDF of x, f of x dx. And we need the, the limits of integration for x. Uh, so u is between 0 and 1. So x is, is also 0 to 1, because you're squaring a number between 0 and 1. Uh, so you get that. Um, so I mean, this is, this is correct, where this is the PDF of x, I mean, this is true, but this, but this would not, you know, this is not a full answer because you haven't said what, what's f of x. I haven't said what's f of x. I mean, I said it's the PDF of x, but what's the PDF of x, right? So if I say write it as an integral, it, sh it should be like an actual, you know, integral where you're saying what, what you're integrating. Here we just said that's the PDF. What's the PDF, okay? So uh, at this point, you could find the CDF of, of x and then take the derivative and get the PDF. 
That's similar to the, uh, the problem you just had on the homework, slightly easier here. You had the homework problem that uniform between minus one and one, okay? Uh, this is a little bit easier because you don't have to deal with negative numbers. So you could find the CDF and then find the PDF and plug that in, and you know, and that would be perfectly valid, but, but, that, but that would be more work uh, versus doing it the better way. The better way is to think of it, uh, wh y equals e to the x is a function of x, but x in turn is a function of u. So I could also write this as e to the u squared and, and do, do lo lotus this way. So if I did it this way, then I, then I would just say it's the integral 0 to 1 e to the u squared du because we know that the PDF of u is just, is just one on this interval. So if I did it this way, I could write down the answer in, li in like, you know, one minute, right? Th this way, then you have to do a separate calculation. Um, now, I mean, that, that uh, I'm saying better just for, for, for like writing down the integral immediately. Not necessarily better for solving the integral. If you, if you want to get, to get a number, then uh, that, that kind of looks like the Gaussian in integral again, except with, without a minus there, and, okay? But, it, but the problem just says leave it as an integral, then this I could just write down instantly, right? And here we have to first find the PDF. Both of these are correct, though, so you get full credit either way as long as, if you did the, either of these, as long as you actually worked out explicitly what the PDF is, that's perfectly fine. Where you'd run into trouble, though, like a, a lot of students had, had trouble in this kind of thing, was somehow like mixing and matching the, these two things. Like somehow, that, somehow I think there's a mindset that just because we define lotus and we called our random variable x and we looked at functions of x, that somehow it, it depends on x. And then if we had another lotus problem where I don't even mention x, and then, and then, then you know, there's gonna be a lot of answers where x's appear. Well, what's, that? what's x, right? So the important thing is the pattern, not, not what you call the variables. Uh, so, so uh, okay. Anyway, that's just some comments about lo Lotus. Um, other, other questions on anything? Yep. Yeah. How would you find the PDF? Yeah, uh, yeah, so let's do that as quick practice with, with not only with PDFs, but with CDFs. Okay, so. First, find the CDF. Um, so, so the CDF is the probability that u squared is less than or equal to some number x. That, that's x, but, but I'm trying to reduce it back to u. So the CDF would be this. And as I said, it's kind of similar to your homework, but, e but easier because here we don't have to worry about negative numbers. So I just take the square root of both sides. That's just the square root of x if x is between 0 and 1. That's the CDF. The derivative is the PDF is just going to be 1 half x to the minus 1 half. Uh, again, x is between 0 and 1. So get the CDF, take the derivative, get the PDF. To get the CDF, all we have to really do is understand what a CDF is and, and then reduce it back to the, the uniform, which, which is something we, we understand. Okay, other questions? Okay, um, so I want to, to do a, a quick example of a, of a, of a story type of proof, uh, just to re review that a little bit. Um, this is a very simple one, but, but I think it's interesting. Just, just as quick, quick practice, right? So quick, quick story practice. Um, if we let x be binomial NP, and the problem is find the, find the distribution of n minus x. Well, one way to do it, this is quick practice with PMFs, would be let's, let's, n minus x is discrete. Let's find its PMF. Well, its PMF is the probability that n minus x is some number k. But let's just rewrite that as the probability that x is n minus k. The same, th those are the same events. Now we've reduced it back to x. Probably that x equals n minus k, that's just from the binomial 
PMF, n choose n minus k, p to the n minus k, q, q is 1 minus p again, q to the k, right? Uh, so that was easy. But a neat, uh, nicer way to write that would be n choose k, uh, q to the k, p to the n minus k. So that would be the PMF method. Remember that n choose n minus k is n choose k, which you can prove easily either using factorials or, ju or just by the, by the story. Pick a, picking k is the same as picking n minus k. Okay, but but uh, a, a simpler way, not not that this is difficult, but an even easier way to to, to see this is using the story. We can immediately say that n minus x is binomial n q just by interchanging successes and failures. Okay, so the story is that x is the number of successes in n iid Bernoulli p trials. So x is the number of successes, then obviously n minus x is the number of failures. Okay, but we, we said repeatedly that you can define success and failure however you want as long as each trial is either success or failure but not both. So if we redefine success to be failure and redefine failure to be success, then that's immediate. So I'll just call that swapping success and failure. Because it, you define it however you want, right? So we could redefine it the other way around and then that's immediate. So no calculation whatsoever, just one line, just to swap success and failure. That's it. So swap success and failure. And I hope, I hope that none of you have, have to do that on the exam, but I think it's good, good, good practice. Now, OK. Uh, so we haven't done any Poissons yet, yet today. So, so there's, a, there's a Poisson example that, that, that I think is also good, good practice. Question? Yeah, the question is whether on the midterm the, there, there may be questions where you can just write, write things down in one line. And yeah, the, 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 there's a good chance that there, I mean, you'd have to write something, right? But there, but there may be se several things where you just write, write like one line or one sentence of explanation because, because you see the story or the pattern or the structure, right? Like one sentence of what's going on, you know, like, like this. I mean, this would be perfect. I mean, just, just writing this immediately, then it doesn't say how you got there. But by saying we're interest swapping success and failure, that, that, you know, that's you know, a, a sentence. And, and this, there's a good chance of something like, like that, which, which would save you some time. So that, 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 that's part of the point. Yeah? Oh, did you get extra credit for writing it's immediately obvious? Yeah, well, don't, don't waste time writing it as immediately obvious. Uh, you got to conserve time. Time is precious. Um, yeah. So let, let's do a Poisson problem. So here's the problem. Um, suppose that um, suppose that the number of this is just an example that I like. Suppose that the number of uh, emails that that I get in a, in a time interval of length t. Let's just say time t. Um, is distributed as Poisson of lambda t, where lambda is some constant. So we're thinking of la lambda as a rate, rate times time, right? So, so, so if I get, you know, if I, if I get, say, 20 emails per hour times the number of hours, then, then that would be the expected number of emails. Remember that this is lambda t is both the mean and the variance of, of this distribution. Okay, so it's a random variable because in different intervals of length t, I mean, I may, I'm not always going to get exactly the same number of emails, so there's, there's some distribution to it. Okay, now the, the problem is find the PDF of t, which we define as the time of, of, of the first email. Like, le, like, let's say right now is time zero. Starting now, what time will, will my first email come? So that's in continuous, right? That, that's a continuous time problem, right? Because the emails could arrive at any time in continuous time, whereas this is discrete because I'm counting the number of emails, okay? So 
So this is kind of neat because it's just connecting discrete and continuous. And let, let's see how to do it. Um, so find the PDF or the CDF. Once we have the CDF, we could take the derivative. You know, so I would normally just say find the distribution or find the PDF or the CDF. Any of those would be fine. Uh, so the CDF would be the probability that t is less than or equal to t. That's a little bit, remember, just as just general advice, you know, when finding probabilities, you should think about is it easier to find that probability or find the complement? In this case, if you think about it a little bit, you'll see that it's easier to find the complement. So let's find the probability that t is greater than t, little t. So that's just 1 minus the CDF. So if we have this, we know the CDF. This is a little bit easier to think about because if we imagine a timeline here where here's time t, and if we, if, we, if we draw an x every time we receive an email, t greater than t means that the first email, let, let's say it's there, so that's, that's time capital T, is to the right of here, right? That says that from time 0 to t, you have no email, right? That's exactly what this says. It says that in time 0 to t, you have no new mail, right? It's, it's, the, it's exactly equivalent. Therefore, that's the exact same thing as saying that the probability of n, um, t greater than t, says, says that nt equals 0, where nt equals number of emails in, uh, in that time interval from 0 to t. So I, I'm defining n sub t to be the number of emails in this time interval, 0 to t. But, but t greater than t says there are none, right? It's the exact same thing. And we assumed that this is Poisson lambda t. So this thing, just, just using the Poisson PMF, it's e to the minus lambda t, lambda t to the 0 over 0 factorial. But that's just e to the minus lambda t, right? So the CDF is 1 minus that. 1 minus e to the minus lambda t for t greater than 0. And if we want the PDF, just take the derivative. So we got lambda e to the minus lambda t. Okay? So, so, so that, that's connecting the Poisson, counting num number of emails to, to exp uh, this is called the exponential distribution, again, related to a homework problem. And again, we'll talk about this distribution later. You don't need to know the exponential distribution yet, but it'd be reasonable you know, to be able to do a problem like this where we're just using the Poisson which is discrete, to, to get a PDF. But lastly, I just want to s remind you again, be very careful about the difference between three, we sort of have three classes of objects. We have our distributions. The distribution is the blueprint for creating a random variable. That was our random house. And then don't confuse a random variable with a, a constant. A constant would be like a specific house. The random variable is the, is the random house. The distribution, the CDF, is the blueprint. And so mixing up those things causes a lot of trouble. So be very careful about that. All right, so good luck.